Democratic Republic of Congo places two provinces under military control. Armed groups have killed hundreds of people and displaced millions. But will the intervention be enough to stop the violence? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Imran Khan. For years, armed groups have instilled fear in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. The government has struggled to maintain order in North Kivu and Ituri provinces. So President Felix Tshisekedi has instructed the army to take charge of two regions for a month. He's declared what's called a state of siege for the first time. Soldiers will take over local government functions and they'll have the right to conduct searches, seize weapons and ban public meetings. Catherine Soy is monitoring developments from Kenya's capital, Nairobi. This law is effective for 30 days to be reviewed and it's the first time it's being used since the post-Civil War constitution was first passed in 2001. And President Felix Shisekedi, uh, during his address to the nation on Sunday, gave the military and police force immense powers in these two uh, provinces. Um, they will now be running administrative duties. Already two generals have been appointed uh, as governors. They will have the power to arrest, um, go forcefully into people's homes without a warrant and arrest those suspected of collaborating and supporting armed groups. Um, the immunity of members of parliament as well as other elected officials has been lifted. This means they can also be arrested on suspicion of supporting um, armed groups. So people are quite worried about uh, this development, saying that perhaps uh, the military uh, could abuse some of these powers, a lot of uncertainty. Other people we've talked to say, are saying that, look, um, the military has been in these regions for many years. These two regions are the most militarized regions uh, in DRC. Tens of thousands of soldiers are currently there, including the peacekeeping mission MONUSCO, um, fighting rebels uh, with little success. Other Congolese we've spoken to say that perhaps this is a radical solution that is needed. The president seems eager to solve a problem that his predecessors failed to. There are more than a hundred armed groups in Eastern DRC. They've been carrying out a series of killings over the years. Thousands of civilians have been killed. Many more have been displaced. Um, there are refugees in neighboring countries like Uganda. Uh, we have internally displaced people um, in places like Ituri province. So civilians saying that they are fed up and they need a solution. But when you talk to the other side, civil society groups and so on, uh, they say that there needs to be checks and balances to make sure that these forces, the military and the police do not abuse their power. More than 300 people have been killed in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo since the start of the year. Now, most of the attacks are blamed on the Allied Democratic Forces, the ADF, which was formed in neighboring Uganda. It's estimated last year the armed group killed 850 people. Now, the violence has displaced more than 1.6 million people in Ituri and more than 2.2 million in North Kivu province. UNICEF says that almost 3 million people in those areas need help. But an appeal for nearly $390 million in emergency funding hasn't even raised $80 million, less than a fifth of what it asked for. Let's bring in our guests. In Masisi, North Kivu province, Neve Murnahan, Democratic Republic of Congo country director for the Norwegian Refugee Council. In Accra, Kambale Musavali, researcher at the Centre for Research on the Congo Kinshasa. And in Cape Town, Patrick Hajiandi, senior project leader at the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation. Welcome uh, to the programme. I'd like to bring in uh, Kambale first in Accra. One of the things I don't really understand about this new move, and we'll come to the state of siege in just a moment, is who are the ADF and what are they fighting for? I mean, the ADF is a Ugandan rebel group. Uh, they've been in the DRC since the early, uh, the late 90s. Uh, they have claims um, that is really around governance in Uganda. Uh, they believe that they are prosecuted. Uh, they have other claims where they, want, they are speaking from 
um, a perspective of bringing Islam into space. Um, I look at actually the fact on the ground. I won't give it much uh, power, but I think that the state of siege is beyond ADF. It's mainly around the multiple uh, rebel groups that's in the region. Uh, beyond the ADF, you have other uh, militia groups that's there, and the Congolese president felt that this is the appropriate time uh, to declare so, uh, which contradicts some of his beliefs. On 21st, uh, 21st of June 2017, before he was president, uh, he was against this position. He himself said that a state of siege was not necessary. But as a president today, he's actually calling for that now. Neve in um, Masisi, do you think a state of siege is actually necessary? I think that, that certainly we are seeing a huge uh, impact on, from the violence in eastern DRC. So the numbers of people that are fleeing violence uh, from their homes are, are significant. Over a million people have fled their homes in, in eastern DRC in the last uh, 18 months. So that means that, that you know, those people are left without their homes, without their livelihoods, without access to, to the services that they need. So clearly, the, the status quo has, has a very negative impact on the civilian population in the country. Uh, in last year alone, 3,000 civilians were killed as a result of the, the conflict, and you know, far more than that were injured. So, you know, the, certainly the situation in eastern DRC is uh, creating a huge humanitarian crisis in the country. But a state of siege, is that the best way of dealing with it? I think that's probably a very political question. I think that, that uh, there are potential consequences from a humanitarian point of view, uh, depending on how the, the state of siege is, is implemented. We could pr pr see a further displacement because people are fleeing military action to, to um, address the, the numerous armed groups in eastern, eastern Congo. It may also become more difficult to provide assistance to those who are already in need, as well as, as any new people that, that will be forced to, to flee because of violence. It was a very a very uh, political question. It was a deliberate political question as well. I want to bring in Kambale uh, in Accra. Um, is this politics? I mean, we need to put that in the framework, right? The state of siege is the last resort. I mean, for viewers probably that don't understand what it may mean, this is martial law. Uh, we have to look at what other processes we've done before that did not work? What is the problem? It's a political problem. Patrick Kammert, a former UN commander in 2008, uh, said that we can put military pressure for Congo's problem, but it is, in the end, a political problem. Now, what is this political pro problem? Since 1996, Congo has been invaded twice by its neighbors, Rwanda and Uganda, and they continue to support proxy rebel militias. We may talk about hundreds of rebel groups, if we do not have Congo's neighbors as stakeholders at peace in DRC, we'll continue to talk about rebel militias in DRC. We'll continue to talk about instability. So the proper way to address it, uh, I don't think that uh, a state of stage at this time is necessary, but it brings challenges. Well, when you have a state of stage without security sector reform, you will have abuse from the military. You know, you can go ahead with the question. Let's bring in Patrick, uh, who's in Cape Town for us. Patrick, is this a political move by the president to declare a state of siege to show that he's actually doing something? Yes. Uh, my view is that uh, the president of DRC uh, actually is uh, working on one of his main promises during the electoral campaign, because one of the idea was to make sure that the eastern part of the DRC is secured. So this is the promise that he made. And I think he's trying really to, to do something about that promise. But in reality, when you look at how things stand, uh, the, the problem of violence in that part of the DRC um, is not only about security issue. It's a, a much more deep problem, which is related to structural violence, which means that there have been failure, institutional failure. There have been uh, a 
the culture of violence have been developing that uh, particular uh, area, and also even the armed groups which uh, operate in that particular region have have had a lot of incentive. Uh, to continue operating. So, in my view, the decision will not yield um, much result, uh, which means that there, there is much of work to do uh, in terms of uh, conducting some deep reforms so that uh, they, they can be some sustainable solutions in that particular area. But, Patrick, our guest in Accra has said already that this isn't an internal uh, DRC problem, that there are regional players that need to be brought into this if there is to be a long-term solution. Do you feel the same way or do you think that the DRC can handle this internally? At this particular time, I think the DRC is not in a position to handle the problem itself. Uh, there is a need for help from uh, neighbouring countries and also the international community. Uh, it would have been very good if uh, MONUSCO, which has been present in that area for the past uh, two decades, uh, to show some results. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it has not been the case. But uh, uh, the problem in DRC cannot be solved by the, uh, the president and the Congolese alone. What we know is that there is a presence of uh, armed groups, as uh, my colleague said already, from the uh, ADF, uh, which is originally a Ugandan armed group. Uh, they are remnant of uh, armed groups from Rwanda, and they are also in the south, in what we call the South Kivu, some groups also originating from Burundi, uh, which includes the uh, Red Tawara and uh, FNL, uh, which is led by uh, General Zabam Um So all those groups are present and they are not Congolese. So if there is a solution to be, uh, if the solution needs to be sustainable, it will include uh, the neighboring countries and the international community helping the Congolese people and the Congolese leadership to find a sustainable solution. And I would really start with the role uh, MONUSCO is playing, which need to be reviewed. And if there is a need to give them more power to operate in that area, uh, they should be given that power and so that they show some tangible results on the ground. Uh, Neve, in Masisi, uh, the, UN, the United Nations Peacekeeping Force, that was just mentioned, uh, MONUSCO, uh, has been there for two decades. Um, and still we're at this position uh, where there's a state of siege. Now, is there any way that the United Nations or any international organisation without a political solution can help the humanitarian crisis that's unfolding? Or is it politics first, then humanitarian? I think I mean, it is undoubtedly a chronic uh, crisis that's been going on, as we said, for more than 20 years. I think that uh, humanitarian response is very much uh, addressing the causes uh, and the results of the conflict, but it doesn't, doesn't address the roots of the conflict. So that does need a political solution. And you know, that, that is unlikely to, to be found within 30 days. But Neve, what, what do you need in order to be able to provide a humanitarian solution? What are your needs right now? Obviously, finance is one of the huge challenges in, in a context like Congo, which has been ongoing for so many years, and we face a situation of donor fatigue. So currently, when we're already four months into the year, the humanitarian response plan for the, the annual appeal for Congo is funded only at 8%. So that, that is a really critical issue for all humanitarian actors here. You know, we're seeing... Uh, between one and two alerts a week of new displacements. The two uh, sites of IDPs this morning that I visited have had more than 600 families arrive in the last month and almost no assistance arriving. So all of the humanitarian actors are stretched very thinly. People are having to reduce staff, reduce presence on the ground at the same time as we are seeing that the needs are increasing. 
currently it's estimated that 27 million people across Congo, which is just it's an unimaginable number, but 27 million people across Congo are in uh, at risk of being food insecure enough to eat this year. So, you know, the needs are enormous and uh, the resources aren't there to meet them. Uh, Patrick, in uh, Cape Town, how much of that is being blamed on the Congolese government? How much of what Neve has just said, people who are displaced, they have food insecurity, they can't eat. How much of that is actually being blamed on the Congolese government's failings rather than the insurgency, the armed groups that are operating? Actually, the first problem when you look at the situation in Congo is that there is a very uh, disconnection between the central government and uh, what is going on in the eastern part of DRC. So, for, for example, um, uh, when I'm working in Burundi, uh, I see a lot of Congolese coming to Bujumbura for banking, for uh, all the needs. They, 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 when they are looking for all the products into the Burundian market. So, which means there is really this disconnection and I don't think that the government in Kinshasa know exactly what is going on in, uh, in, in Eastern Congo. So this is one of the first problems to be solved. How can, we, can the Congolese government uh, reduce this disconnection and establish uh, working channels to be able to, to support uh, the, the population in East of DRC. So that's the first question. The second one is that because of the long time of war in that particular area, uh, the population has been um, in a situation when they are not able to, uh, to look for solution for a very long term. That's why uh, you do not see them uh, plowing the, the land. They are not cultivating. They are not growing food. And that's a, it's a problem which is directly connected to uh, the fact that the area has been in insecurity for a very long time. So the, the question is about how the government is going to implement some new policies which uh, will help uh, to improve security, and as I said, in collaboration with the international community and with the, uh, re the regional uh, countries, and how also on the horizontal um, uh, line, how uh, the population are going to feel safe and be encouraged to, to do the daily work which will allow them to have, uh, to meet their needs, like uh, uh, growing food, like doing business normally, so that they have what they need. So those are a few of the, the things which can be done at the present, but it's a very long process, and uh, the, the issue of security is paramount to be solved first, uh, so that people uh, feel that there is uh, at least a, a sense of peace and sense of, of, of security where they live, uh, whether, whether they go to work, uh, whether well, they let's just Let's just bring in uh, Kambale here in Accra. Kambale, you've heard everything uh, that Patrick has had to say in Cape Town. It strikes me that a state of siege, a state of emergency, is the first step to providing security. Monusco, the, the United Nations peacekeeping force, after 20 years, hasn't been able to do that. We have a massive humanitarian crisis, as Neve has just been talking to us about. Surely it's time to use the money that Monusco were spending for humanitarian needs, get that done first, disband the UN peacekeeping force, get a state of siege in and provide security. Security needs to come first, surely. Yeah, I mean... There are many people to have responsibility for what's happening in DRC. Uh, the Congolese government has, uh, regional partners have, multilateral institutions such, such as the UN uh, and the African Union, they have uh, also a role to play. Uh, but when you're speaking about the United Nations, particularly the UN forces, uh, there have been operations that's been successful. Now look at the force, the Intervention Rapide, the FIB force, the uh, Force Intervention Brigade uh, that started in 2012. When you had African uh, nations coming together, uh, Tanzania sent their troops, South Africans sent their troops, to stop the M23 rebels. They were successful at doing so. These forces came under the umbrella of uh, the United Nations, and there are many things that they could have done more if they were not under that. Uh, right now, we see that the Congolese president 
as an agreement, a military agreement with Kenya to come and deal with the issue of the rebel forces. We see also a call for Africa. All these military solutions are worrying the people of the East. In Beni and Butembo, people have been massacred for decades in that region. In 2018, really the epicenter of why we are even talking about governance in DRC, an election uh, happened. Someone was declared the winner of the election, Felix Tshisekedi. He is now the president of the Congo where we are discussing if this government can actually lead. Do you remember that in 2018, the people of Beni, of Butembo, and Yumbi did not vote? The reason why the government did not allow them to vote is because they say there was insecurity in these uh, cities and also the Ebola outbreak around Beni and Butembo. These people for decades have suffered tremendously. They have not been consulted uh, for solutions and they have a particular worry. Their number one worry is with this state of siege, having military in power, when you have human rights abusers, they are known, they are in the military. They are former rebels of yesterday. Now they will have free reign in the North Kivu province, in the Inturi province, because now they are the one ruling. What will be the checks and balances for that? So we have to speak about, one, the voice of the Congolese is not heard. Anytime the voice of the Congolese is not heard, we come up with uh, more and more issues happening, and we're only addressing the symptoms. The fundamental problem for the Congolese since 1960 is they have not been able to determine their affairs. When they try to do so, they impose leaders. And we are coming... Sorry, Kambale, we are, we are running out of time, and I do want to bring in the other guests. It's an alarming thought, Neve Monahan, in uh, Masisi. If there is this state of siege and there are human rights abuses by the Congolese army, that's going to create a bigger humanitarian crisis. Are you worried about that? I think we are, are all concerned about what could uh, be involved in NATO siege. As yet, there hasn't been any detail, but certainly, you know, we we could envisage a situation where access may be difficult, where new displacement happens, and and where uh, populations are left feeling more insecure than they currently do. Uh, in Cape Town, uh, Patrick, do you still believe that this? State of siege is the only way forward for the, in the current situation if there are no regional solutions, if there are no political solutions? Uh, no, actually, I don't think that the, the decision by the president of, of DRC uh, can solve any problem, especially because it will be just for 30 days. So, and as I said, the problem is much deeper uh, because it's a structural problem which needs to touch the institution, to touch how the society uh, in, as a whole function. So it will not really bring any uh, solution. And also, we have to understand that uh, that area, the eastern, those provinces, uh, North Kivu, uh, the provinces of Ituri, they have been under siege for a very long time. So what the president is, uh, is doing is not really new. He has just made it official, but in general, those people have been under siege for a very long time. So it's not a sustainable solution. Uh, and I totally agree with Kambale that he, there is a need to consult to the population on the ground so that uh, uh, local solutions are understood because those people uh, who are living on a daily basis seeing the violence, they have some understanding that need to be brought on a table so that uh, their views are taken into account because they may suggest some innovative sol solution which uh, the central government is not reflect on, reflecting on. So um, that's my view. I want to thank all our guests, Neve Monahan, Kambale Musavali, and Patrick Hajiyandi, and thank you too for watching. You can see this program and all our previous programs again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the whole team here, bye for now.